Ocean Crew, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Karen and I'm from Ocean Chicks Films. Tonight, I'm starting a new review series called Deep Dives, where I'll be taking an in-depth look at some horror and sci-fi classics. Starting with the 1978 horror film Piranha, directed by Joe Dante. Thousands of military hybrid piranhas are accidentally released into a river used by a children's summer camp. The race is on to get downstream before the flesh-eating fish do. Starring Bradford Dillman, Heather Menzies, and Kevin McCarthy. This film is produced by Roger Corman, and it is the first in a series of B-movies inspired by the Jaws movie from 1975. It's also a large part of the reason why I was terrified to go swimming as a kid. Bathtubs, pools, lakes, any of it. I was absolutely terrified. This film almost didn't happen because there were copyright issues because it was a ripoff of Jaws after all. But Steven Spielberg, who did Jaws, watched it and gave it a two thumbs up and so then it was allowed to proceed forward. And it ended up doing really well in the box office and it's become a cult classic. It was followed by a sequel, Piranha 2, in 1982 and then by two remakes. And of the remakes, one of them had a sequel made to it as well. And if this film's not gory enough for you, you gotta check out one of the remakes, Piranha 3D, cause that one's got a lot of gore. This film was directed by Joe Dante, and he's known for stuff like Gremlins, The Howling, Inner Space, and lots more. He did this film and it kind of put him on the map. And just so you know, there will be spoilers. So if that's not cool with you, then just click off now. But if it is cool, let's keep going. The story begins with these two teenagers that have backpacks and they've come up upon this military compound that has this very large swimming pool. So the couple does go swimming. The girl really wants to go and the boy is kind of like, I don't really wanna go in. What if this is like a sewage power plant or something like that? She's laughing it off like that's silly. Let's just go swimming. So they do go swimming, but at that moment you get that feeling of a bit of tension that maybe there's something wrong with this pool. And it's also nighttime, so you can't see in the water very well. There's just little bits of lights here and there, so that makes it very tense too. And as the story goes, the two are attacked and killed by something mysterious in the water, very horrifically. There's lots of screaming and whatnot, and then the water turns to red. <laughs> this is our first tidbit of the piranhas, and they do make noise. And it sounds like there's bees up close against the microphone, and that's how they got the sound effect of the piranha. But it's actually not. I learned later that it's a dentist drill against the microphone, which is really crazy. I was like, once I knew that, I was like, yeah, that's what it actually is. And because, you know, a lot of people are scared of the dentist, they're scared of that drill. Uh, it, it kind of brings up fear inside of you when you hear it. So that sound accompanied with the fish flopping around and the jerky camera movement and the water and the idea that they're feeding, it's kind of scary. So the piranhas themselves were actually puppets on a stick that would actually chomp down um, on the artificial limbs and things that they had to bite into. And the whole effect looked really, really weird and freaky. So this woman named Maggie McEwen, played by Heather Menzies, she's put on the job to find these teens because they're reported as being missing. Now the actress, Heather Menzies, was actually pretty cool to me that she's Canadian and she was married to Robert Urich for a short time. Um, she passed away, unfortunately, at the age of 68, so a few years back. And um, what was really, really cool to me was that she was in Logan's Run. So I love that movie so much. I thought that was really neat. I love all the little bits of trivia that you find with uh, actors and actresses, producers, directors, all connected in different films. I find that really fascinating. So Maggie is looking for the teens and she goes to this little town called Lost River Lake where they were last reported going, I suppose. And she starts questioning the local townspeople to see what's going on. She connects with this man. He's um, kind of out there, out of work, drinking a lot, in this cabin, thinking his life through. So this man's name is Paul Grogan. He's played by Bradford Dillman. And they connect. He decides to take her to this place nearby, um, which is like a, a military compound that's been abandoned. And they go searching for the, t the teens there. 
and they stumble upon their backpack. So she's thinking, yeah, they're, they were here. Or they are here still. So they go inside. They find this big swimming pool. They go to drain it. This crazy man comes running out, yelling for them to stop. Don't do it because these genetically modified piranha are in the pool and you're going to release them into the lake and once they get out into the lake they're going to start killing and eating people and they're going to make it all the way to the ocean so she's in disbelief thinks he's crazy it turns out he's a mad scientist that worked for this compound when it was functioning and what it was was the uh, government were creating this uh, experiment to create these genetically altered you know, man-eating piranha fish that could live in cold water so that they could send them over to North Vietnam for the war and, you know, kill the people and that kind of thing. So this doctor is named Robert Hoke and he's played by Kevin McCarthy. But of course it's too late. She's already done the damage. The piranha are out there and the doctor's really pleading with them to help stop things. And then the dad, uh, Paul, he realizes that my daughter is downriver at this summer camp um, with all of her friends. And they also realize that there's this like big political kind of um, gathering. Um, I forget what it was for, but they're, they're out there, you know, with all the people having a big picnic and everyone's in the water and celebrating that's all down river. So if they don't like shut down the dam or stop them, they're gonna get to the people and all the people are gonna get killed. So on their journey down river, the doctor ends up sacrificing his life to save this little boy that they find on a canoe abandoned because his dad was killed. Um, you know, and lots of people get killed, lots of children get killed. It's very graphic and horrifying. And uh, the couple realizes they're going to need to uh, pollute the water with this uh, excess uh, toxic waste that's in this facility in order to kill all the piranha off and save the day. But in the end, the piranha, I think it is implied that they go out into uh, the ocean and they're still alive and existing, which means that there's probably going to be a part two, which there is. Dick Miller is in this movie too, I forgot to mention, um, as is Melody Thomas Scott, who played Nikki on uh, Young and Restless. And the reason I know that is because my parents were huge, huge fans of that show. And she's one of the camp counselors. She's really young in this, so it's really cool. Uh, and uh, the little girl, the, the dad, his little girl ends up being okay. And she ends up saving her, but not the other camp counselor who um, tragically gets sucked down and dies very sad. There's one scene near the end where they, Maggie and Paul go to this facility to try to open the valve to let the toxic waste drain into the water um, to kill all the piranhas. And uh, this facility is underwater, submerged underwater for some weird reason. And uh, it, they have to, he has to swim underneath the water to get to the uh, door to get in to do this thing. And so he ties a rope to himself, which is tied to the boat that they have. And she's supposed to count to a hundred before she gives up on him and just books it and drags him out of there, uh, whether he's opened the valve or not. And it's like she counts to 300, which he could never hold his breath that long, but they kind of drag it out that way. So it's a little bit hokey, <laughs> kind of makes it funny. This is supposed to be a horror comedy, actually. Um, back in the day, I didn't see it that way, but I guess I can see it that way now. To me, more of a spoof on the whole Jaws thing because they rip off a lot of different parts of it. Um, like in Jaws where the mayor is having that big um, event on the beach to open the beach for the long weekend um, and everybody's there and getting eaten by Jaws. Uh, it, same kind of deal in this movie too, except with the piranha at the, the river, right? Steven Spielberg actually fighting the studio to not allow them to stop production of this film was a cool thing because it kind of drew Joe Dante and Spielberg together uh, and they ended up working together down the road on uh, Twilight Zone the movie. So that's kind of a neat trivia tidbit. The concept of this film is pretty scary. The acting's kind of hit and miss. A um, little hokey here and there sometimes. Um, the effects kind of hokey for nowadays, but back then it was it was scary and it was believable. It's stylized very 70s, late 70s, and it, in my opinion, pumped up the Jaws franchise and made them more popular and 
these films stopped people from going in the water. <laughs> it really did back in the day. People were really freaked out. And on a rewatch, it's one of those kind of films that you pop on and you get sucked right into. It's, they're, they're good films. They're very uh, nostalgic. And having children be killed and hurt and having the little girl wandering around all these bodies that are covered in thin white sheets is pretty traumatizing and it's pretty horrifying um, for back then. I think even for today, don't you think? And there's another sad scene where this uh, old man has a dog and he gets killed and the dog won't leave his side. It's just like, wow. Well, I believe Joe Dante's first thing he did was a trailer and editing. And from the editing, he learned how to keep and cut parts and put things together to make them work. And he said that it, that experience helped him to direct. Now this movie, Piranha, was his first chance at really doing it on his own, directing. But he also did a lot of the editing too, and he would get so obsessed with it. Um, he said it was so difficult editing the Piranha because there's so much motion and craziness going on that you would get to a point where your eyes were buggy and you couldn't see what worked together and what didn't work together but it it turned out to be a really great film and uh you know it did really well joe dante was really skeptical about doing this film in the first place because it was just a ripoff of jaws but roger corman convinced him to do it and they sat down the original storyline was actually changed what they had was a bear chasing people basically into the water to get killed by the piranha um, and then they changed it to like a forest fire or something like that. And they decided, yeah, but then when they're in the water, then what? There's not really any story there. So uh, Joe Dante really wanted to bring in a science fiction angle to it. And um, Roger Corman, he said, is really known for oftentimes bringing in a political slant on it. So they went with the whole military aspect instead and they figured they had a good gig here. And they actually filmed, uh, Roger Corman made him film all of the scenes with the piranha first before he would allow him to proceed with the, the storyline with the rest of the people. So that's how they filmed it. So Joe Dante said that Roger Corman was really incredible to work with um, and that he often was very well loved by actors and directors because he would always hire them and he was a little different and he was a really good go-between between them and the studios. And through this whole process of this movie, Joe Dante said he really understood that. And so they became good friends and often, you know, people would have uh, Roger Corman in their movies as well and uh, they did more work together. So like I said, Roger and Joe changed the story and they came up with this idea of of a military base that was experimenting on these piranha to genetically modify them to become super killers and use them as a weapon against the North Vietnamese. Um, and then I guess things didn't happen that way. So these, these animals were kind of left, you know, trapped and also that they could swim in cold water instead of warm. So they were dealing with a really low budget for this film. So they had to cut corners and get really creative. Um, and they needed access to like military jeeps and personnel and uniforms and all that kind of thing. So what they did was because the whole storyline was really negative against the military in a way, they uh, sent them a fake script to make them shine and look glorious. And they were able to have access to their military vehicles and you know personnel and that kind of thing for really, really, really cheap or no money at all. And um, they were lucky in that none of these people ended up watching the movie afterwards. So <laughs> they never got caught. I find that really hilarious. Dante wanted stop motion in this film. And so they created this creature that's running around in that sort of lab place where they uh, open up the valve to let the drain the pools. And um, you only see him there. It doesn't really make a lot of sense except that they were able to put that in there. Now, if they had a huger budget, he said at the end, they would have had this creature grown like massive, huge, coming out and attacking everybody, but they didn't have the budget for that, so they didn't do it. But they have that little bit in there. I thought that was kind of funny too. Initially, they wanted Peter Fonda to play the lead in this film, but they asked him and he was kind of gonna do it, but he said, I wanna be for sure knowing that these special effects are incredible. And so before they could kind of show that to him or prove that to him, he was on to another job and he never did do the, the role. He would have been good in it too, I guess, but I think it was cast 
pretty well. Another crazy thing was back then there was very, very little footage, even in documentaries and that, of piranha swimming and uh, feeding in the wild, in the water. So they had to be really creative that way. I like that too. That's really incredible. The idea of the dentist drill and the puppets kind of going through the water and making that sound is kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies. It did back then and it made me scared to go swimming. It really did. They were able to land Pino Donaggio, who's an Italian composer, to do the score for this film, um, even though they had such a small, small budget, but um, because he really wanted to be a part of it uh, and they could cut through the middleman and that kind of thing, they were able to pull it off. The only thing was Joe Dante wasn't didn't really have control over it. They just did it and sent it to him and that was that, but he was okay with that because like I say, that first film, low budget, you know, worked out really well. Joe Dante was put on the aquatic map, as he states, um, <laughs> after this film. And it makes me think of Brett Kelly with Ouija Shark. Uh, it's a good thing, see? And he was put on the aquatic map and he was offered all kinds of water-related horror movies like uh, Orca 2. He was offered Alligator, um, Barracuda. <laughs> you know, I don't think he did any of those ones, but anyways, <laughs> he was offered them. Orca was another cool movie, actually. I should review that one, too. Um, I've never seen the second one, though, so maybe if he had done it, it would have been more well-known. I don't know. And Alligator, come on. I still haven't seen the original one of that. I saw the second one, but not the first one. Can't get a hold of a copy of it. Gotta keep trying, though, because I want to see it. So this was a fun movie to do. I wasn't going to do it, and then I went back over, and I thought, no, I want to talk about it because it's from such a long time ago, and it's really a good one to revisit. So for my review, I'm going to give it four shark bites out of five because I thought it was good, and I recommend you watch it. So let me know in the comment section below what you think. And if you like this video, don't forget to give me a thumbs up because it helps me a lot and subscribe to the channel for more deep dives like this. I'm going to be doing them every Wednesday, so you got to tune in for that. And don't forget to turn on that bell notification button so that you get notified when I upload. And I'll be doing more movie talk interviews, of course, and Spirits and Screams live streams. We've got a watch party coming up this Saturday night at 7 p.m. Pacific time. We're going to look at the movie Terrifier. Oh my God, Art the Clown. You cannot go wrong with this movie. So much fun. So don't forget to check that out. I'm also going to be looking at a very dark horror independent film, very recent, um, called Flowers. I'm going to be reviewing that on Friday for you. And uh, we are fortunate enough to get one of the actresses from that film to come on a live stream with us. So I'll be telling you more about that next week. Uh, stay tuned for that too. I just wanna say thank you guys so much for stopping by. I love you all. We'll see you again next time. Bye guys.